Can you hear me okay? All right, just checking, okay. All right. I see gaps over here. I see gaps everywhere. We, we don't pray like that at Destiny. We come together and make sure there are no gaps between us. That's how powerful agreement is. I said, that's how powerful agreement is. I feel like the Spirit of God has already switched down on this house. Well, thank you for your enthusiasm. I really feel the Spirit of God has already entered into this house. Turn to your neighbor and say, so you better be careful. Father, in the name of Jesus, what you have already done is just phenomenal. It feels so good in this house tonight. And I know we don't walk by feelings, but it sure feels good here. We thank you for your presence. We thank you not only for what you've already done, but for what you're about to do also. Father, I am so grateful for my brothers and sisters, especially that one on my left and that one on my right. Father, as I squeeze their hand, can you let them know how grateful we are for them and how much they mean not only to us, but how much they mean to you. Father, tonight, fill them with Godfidence not confidence, Godfidence, that they begin to realize and understand who they are in you and what they are able to accomplish because of you. And Father, let that person on my left and on my right and those that might be watching us over social media tonight, let them know that your word has said, get up and go forward. Begin to use your authority in the name of Jesus to accomplish everything God has called you to accomplish. And Father, let them know, rest assured, that you will be all God said that you would be. Not only you, but also your household. For there's a spirit of redemption about to come into that household. And those in your household that the devil thought he had, he will release them in the name of Jesus. We thank you for our children coming home. We thank you for the backslider coming home. We thank you for those that the enemy has pulled away. We thank you that they're coming home. We thank you that they're coming from the north and the south and the east and the west. We call them forward now in Jesus' name. Come home. Come home. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Before you're seated, lift your hands up. Lift your hands up. And I want you to repeat with me really loud. Say, I am the best. I can do it. God's always with me. I'm a winner. And today's my day. Now give the Lord a praise and you may be seated. I want to begin to flow in my assignment for tonight. And my assignment for tonight is to talk with you about developing a conquering spirit. Uh, let me try that again. I did, I, I, wait a minute. Maybe I don't have any conquerors here. Well, then let me try that again. My assignment tonight is to share with you how to develop a conquering spirit. And I believe, I believe that goes right along with what God has been speaking tonight. A conqueror has to get unstuck before he can conquer anything. Developing a conquering attitude is of utmost importance. Acts chapter 20 verse 22 says, And see now, I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem, 
not knowing the things that will happen to me there. I'm going to Jerusalem. I don't know what's, what's going to happen there, but I'm going. Verse 23, I do know this, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations will await me. Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute, Paul and Barnabas here are saying, well, I, I'm going to Jerusalem, but, but I know the Spirit of God has told me that there are chains and tribulations waiting for me there. Now, I submit to you tonight that one that doesn't know how to conquer would take that and say, you know what, forget it, I'm not going. Why should I go someplace where there's going to be chains and tribulations? Why should I go there? I'm not stupid. I ain't no dummy. I'm not going to go there. Why should I go there? Because the Spirit of God is telling you to go there. We all want to go to Hawaii, but nobody wants to go to Africa. You just got back. What are you talking about? Huh? Huh? Uh, God, I want to go to mi on the mission field. I want to go. I want to go to uh, to Hawaii. Don't send me to, uh, to to Africa for the mission field. Did you notice that? And see now, I go bound in the Spirit. In other words, he was being led by the Holy Ghost to go to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there. Right there, some of us would have said, that's not God. Yes, it is. He told Abraham the same thing. He said, Abraham, get up and go. Abraham didn't even ask, where are you taking me? He just got up and went. And I believe God is saying to some of you, time's coming where I'm going to tell you to get up and go. And I don't need any questions from you. I believe God said, I just need for you to get up and go. And then look at what he said. Look what he said. Except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. Now this next verse is so very, very powerful. Verse 24. On the, on the count of three, let's read that real loud. Ready? One, two, three. Stop. That wasn't, that wasn't loud. That was ugly. That was awful. Can anybody, you know how to get loud like you do with your kids? Or when you're partying, you get loud? I want us to read that really loud. Can we please? One, two, three. Stop. Read it again. Stop. Read it one more time. But none of these things move me. The Spirit of God is sending me to Jerusalem. The Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost, is telling me that when I get there, there's going to be change and tribulations. But you know what he's saying? He's saying, but I don't care. He's saying, none of these things move me. What he's saying is, that doesn't matter. It's nothing. If the Spirit of God is leading me there, I don't care if there's change and tribulations. I don't care what's there. It doesn't matter. None of those things move me. Why? Because I have god confidence. Why? Because I know it's the Spirit of God leading me there. And if the Spirit of God is going to lead me there, no weapon formed against me shall prosper because the Spirit of God is leading me there. I've seen people go where the Spirit of God didn't lead them and they're nowhere around anymore. It was a godly work. But they weren't sent. The Spirit of God didn't send them, but they went anyway. They didn't go with confidence. They went with confidence, but not god confidence, Because they weren't led to go there by the Spirit of God. Are you hearing what I'm saying tonight? But none of these things move me. Paul says, I know change and tribulation and suffering is waiting for me where I'm headed, but none of these things move me. It's not my focus. I'm not spending all my energy just thinking about that. 
Because where all my energy goes is usually going to manifest. So I'm not thinking, I'm not focusing on that. I'm not dreaming about it. I'm not talking about it because it's not a big thing. But why is it that we as believers make it big when it's not a big thing? Because it's called a spirit of exaggeration. And it's real. It's real. Now I'm not going to ask you because I don't know how truthful you'd be with me here. But how many times have you spent sometimes days worrying about something that never happened? Don't, don't, don't raise your hand. Huh? Huh? You, 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 you cried and you and, and, and worried and, and worried and worried and, and when it came to the time, it never happened. Sure is quiet in this Pentecostal church. It's no big thing. And then look, look what, he, what he goes on to say. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself so that I might finish my race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify of the gospel and of the grace of God. Doesn't matter to me what's there. I'm going to go there and look what he says. Look at the confidence. Look at the confidence. And I'm, 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 I'm going to finish my race. Not, in my, not only am I going to finish it, but I'm going to finish it with joy. Turn to your neighbor and say, that's Godfidence. I'm going to finish it with joy. I love that. But wait a minute. Didn't you just hear there's chains and tribulations? Huh? There's the cribs and the bloods. And, huh? And, and there's the vatos and, and the vata, shy girl. And they're all going to be there. And he says, I don't care. None of these things move me. I'm going to go there. God's going to take care of me. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. As a matter of fact, I'm going to finish my race. And I'm going to finish it with joy. I don't care what's there. I'm going to finish my race anyway. And if we as Christians could get that attitude, developing a conquering attitude, that I don't care what the enemy does or tries to do. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what they're saying. I don't care what they're doing. Me, I'm going to finish my race and I'm going to do it with joy do I have any Jesus lovers here can you get up and give Jesus a praise can you turn me up please I'm going to finish my race with joy none of these things move me these are the words of a man who was determined say determined He was strong-minded. He was unwavering. He was tenacious to do what God had called him to do. Now, the Webster Dictionary defines the word determination as firmly resolved, becoming unwavering in one's actions. And listen, becoming unwavering in one's actions and attitudes. That's what determination means. When you're saying, I'm, a de- I'm determined to do what God's called me to do, that means that you're firmly resolved. Nothing can move you. It means that you're becoming unwavering in your actions and in your attitudes. Is you're saying, I have determined, I have determination. I will not waver in my actions and I will not waver in my attitude. Turn your name and say, some of us have a BA, tell them. Oh, you went to college? No, a a bad attitude. And a bad attitude is a good sign of no determination. As a matter of fact, if you dwell on a bad attitude, sooner or later you're going to waver. And when you begin to waver, listen, listen, I'm giving you the enemy's battle plan. When you begin to waver, the enemy will isolate you because you're not firmly resolved. You're weak. And wherever the wind blows, that's where you're going to go. And the devil's going to blow you in such a way that he will hear me, that he will isolate you. And when you're isolated, then you begin to think and think and exaggerate and build it up and think. And you have illusions and you have illusions. And before you know it, you're no longer flowing where you used to flow before because you were not firmly resolved. You were wavering. You weren't determined. 
Now remember, they told him there's going to be change there. There's going to be, there's going to be tribulation. There's going to be gossip. There's going to be persecution. There's going to be finger pointing. There's going to be mocking. Everything else you find in the church, it's going to be right there. Are you still going? Absolutely. The Spirit of God is leading me there. None of those things move me. As a matter of fact, for the glory of God, I'm going to run my race, and I'm going to run it, and I'm going to finish it, and I'm going to finish it with joy because that's when God gets the glory. You see, look, listen to me. Listen to me. Hear this. Write it down. Hear this. Write it down. Always come with paper and pencil. Quit being so rebellious. Write it down. Write this down, okay? Are you ready? Rebellion is a sign of one's lack of determination. And the enemy will use it as an ending point, E-N-D-I-N-G, ending point. Now write this down, write this down. But what the enemy means as an ending point, write that down. What the enemy means as an ending point, God will use it as a turning point. What the enemy means for it to be an ending point to cut you off and defeat you and beat you up. What he means as an ending point, God will use it as a turning point. Turning point, yes. What the enemy meant for evil, God will turn it around and use it for his glory. A turning point. Somebody shout turning point. Did you get that? Did you get that? Amen. Unwavering. Now let me give you the definition of unwavering. Unwavering means to become weaker. Unwavering means, I mean, uh, 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 wavering. It means to become weaker. It means to flicker like a light going out. Oh, Wavering means to be undecisive. It means to become unsteady. Wavering means to begin to fail or give way. And I like this one. Wavering means to sway back and forth. You can't waver. If you're going to develop a conquering attitude, which is what God is assigning us to do tonight, you must not waver. You must be resolved. You must stand firm, not in confidence and confidence in what God has called you to do or assigned you or in what God is using you and you do not let anything or anyone move you. Do not waver. Begin to develop a conquering attitude So a conquering attitude says, I will not waver. I will stand firm. And when I've done all to stand, I'm going to stand. And when I've done all to stand, I'm going to stand. And when I've done all to stand, I'm going to stand. When I've done all to stand, that's what the word says. When you've done all to stand, what do you do next? You stand. You don't waver. You become determined. Look at Romans chapter 4. Look at verse 19, please. Romans 4, 19. Look at this. That's 21. Do we have 19 up there? Romans 4, 19 says this. And not being weak in faith. Get that. Get that. Turn to your neighbor and say, don't be weak in faith. And not being weak in faith, talking about Abraham, when God told him they were going to give him a child. And Abraham was over a hundred years old. Sarah's womb had been closed. Remember the story? Turn to your neighbor and say, you know the story. That's what it's talking about. Verse 19. Talking about Abraham. And not being weak in faith. 
He did not consider his own body. He did not consider the situation. He did not consider the circumstances. He didn't consider what he felt like. He didn't consider what he looked like. He didn't consider any of that. He considered not his own body already dead since he was about 100 years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb, 20. He did not waver. Woo! Huh? He did not waver. Say that. He did not waver. Say it again. He did not waver. Look, he did not waver at the promise of God through one belief. You must not waver. If God said it, that settles it. You stand firm. You become determined. And you begin to develop a concrete attitude. He did not waver. At what? At the promise that God had given him. If God has ever promised you anything and you've yet to see it, stand up. I'm already standing. Thank you. And I got some honest people here. God has promised you something and you've yet not to see it. <clears throat> I have a word for you. Don't waver. Don't give in. Don't flick out. Stand firm. Get determined. Make up your mind. God said it. That settles it. None of these things move me. To every single one of you and me, the word of the Lord is, do not waver at the promises of God. Come on, somebody bless his holy name. You may be seated. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief. But must, was strengthened in what? Come on, it's right up. It's on the screen, folks. You can't miss it. You can't miss it. He was strengthened in what? Faith. Say it again. Faith. Say it again. Faith. How? Giving glory to God. Wow. Yeah. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> what? <laughs> How can he give glory to God? He hasn't seen the promise yet. Isaac isn't born yet. What is he, cuckoo? Is he crazy? Giving glory to God for what? For his promises. He knew enough about God. Remember, Abraham was a friend of God. He said to others, I speak through prophets and stuff. He said, but to my friend Abraham, I speak face to face. Remember that? That's how, it, that's how he knew God. That's how uh, intimate Abraham was with God. So when God that spoke face to face with him gave him a promise for Abraham, it was as good as done. So what did he do? He started by faith giving glory to God for what by faith was already done. And it wasn't done yet, but in his faith, it, it was already done. He didn't say, when God? Why God? Where God? Who God? No. No. No, that is why Abraham is called the father of faith. He's one of the greatest examples in the word of God of what it is to walk by faith. He's not called our father. We only have one father, and that's God. He is called the father of faith because of this. And, and, and the Bible says it later on in Romans that it was accounted to him as righteousness. The friend of God. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God because he had God confidence that what God had promised, God will do. Well, thank you back there. Thank you for being faithful and supporting me. Thank you. How did he do that? Verse 21. Verse 21. How did he do that? Verse 21. And being fully convinced, he was fully convinced, and being fully convinced that what he had promised, who? God. Being fully convinced that what God had promised, God was also able to perform. Godfidence. He was fully convinced. 
You know, so many of us here in this house tonight are not even half convinced. We're not. I mean, you know, can I be truthful? Really, can I be truthful? We're not fully convinced. That's why some of you walked in tonight hanging lip. God bless you. Thank you. If I was fully convinced and I was going to the worship place of God, say, hallelujah, maybe this is the night. I know God says he's going to do it. Maybe he'll do it tonight. Oh, it doesn't matter. Even if he doesn't do it tonight, I know God's going to do it. Why are you so confident? I don't have confidence. I have confidence because God promised it. Cardinals, give the Lord a praise. God, come on. No, I want you to praise him. God has given you promises. And if you don't learn how to praise him the way he deserves to be praised, you may not see it. And God has a tremendous assignment for your life. God trusts you. God loves you. And God has separated you from many things and many people. But you got to learn to give a praise ahead of time before it even gets there. God's going to use you, son. God's going to use you. But he won't use people who don't have confidence because it's confidence that he will use to develop a conquering attitude in you. You're not the victim, church. I'm not teaching you that stuff to hype you up. Hype you, hyping you up is not going to keep you out of hell. Sometimes people hype you up so much, you forget about God, you'll end up in hell. How many of you know there's a real hell? I said, how many of you know there's a real hell? It's not about the accolades of the people. It's about God's accolade over your life. His praise is over you. What he has spoken over you. I've learned in 30-something years that, I mean, I thank God for those that encourage me and and support me. and, and, And I thank God for them. I'm very grateful. God has surrounded me with some tremendous young men and ladies and women, especially my wife and my children and my grandchildren. So grateful for that. But as much as I love them, nothing more is more to me than to know that at the end of the day, I glorified God. That didn't go over very well, did it, Mark? And being fully convinced that what God had promised, fully convinced. You know what that means? He was determined. You know what fully convinced means? He wasn't wavering. You know what fully convinced is? Tell your children, tell the little girl it's in first grade. You know what, baby? I'm going to buy you a new dress. She'll go to school and tell everybody what you promised her. You haven't even bought it yet, but she is so believing you. She is so not doubting you. She'll go to school and tell everybody her daddy's going to buy her a new dress. I wish we would get back to that stage. I wonder if that's what it means to have the faith of a child. I wonder. Well, we don't question God. We just take his word for it. And we become what? Fully convinced about what? That what God had promised, God was also able to perform. Give give the Lord a praise. Come on, give the Lord a praise. Is this helping anybody? Have I confused you yet? Let me see if I can confuse you now. Let's see. Everybody repeat after me really loud with an attitude. Say desperation Desperation. produces desire. Desire 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 produces determination. determination. And your determination, come on, I'm losing you. And your determination, say that again. One more time. Produces your destiny. destiny. I say that again. I'm not convinced you've got it. Desperation Desperation. produces desire. Desire 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 produces determination. determination. And your determination determination produces your destiny. destiny. 
Young people, you better hear what I'm telling you. Because life ain't going to give you nothing free. Old people, you better hear what I'm telling you because you're still waiting for life to give you something free. There's not too many old of you, not too many old people in here tonight, maybe three of us, but, but it's for, that word's for us three. Let me talk about Rizfa for a minute. She was one of the cute concubines of King Saul. Turn to some and say, oh, she was a prostitute. It sounds worse in Spanish. It sounds nicer in English when you say prostitute. But in Spanish when you say prostituta, it sounds a hundred times bad. She was, she, was, she was a concubine of King Saul. She had two sons. Listen, listen. She had two sons who were hung by the Gibeonites. And what she did is she spread a cloth on a rock. And for three months she lived there. And she kicked the jackals and beat the fowls of the air off the corpse of her three sons. She put them there. They'd come and try to eat. And the mother, only a mother has that kind of heart, can chase all that stuff away protecting her two sons. They were dead. But she was so determined to save her family and her sons were dead. If she was that determined to kick the jackals and beat the, the birds off her dead children, how much more should we be more determined to see all of our children saved and free and in the purposes of God? She had a determination about her family and she held on to it and the word reached the king. She had a concrete attitude. I don't care if they're dead. Only a mother can say that. The father will say, oh, come on, baby, leave them alone. They're, they're dead. They're in a better place. God wanted another angel in heaven. No, he didn't. He's got a lot of angels. God just picked the flower of the garden to plant it in the garden of heaven. No, he didn't. If you don't know what to say to somebody, don't say nothing. We say to people, you know, I'm sorry you lost a loved one. They're not lost. If they're born again, they're in heaven. They're in the presence of God. And we know how to get there. They're not lost. They're not lost. And so when you realize that they're not lost, we don't talk about them in past tense. Well, you know, your mother, God bless her heart. She was a good woman. Well, wait a minute. Was your mother saved? Was your mom saved? Yes. Was she born again? Yes. So is she dead? No. The word says she what? She'll live forever. Where? In heaven. So is your mom dead or alive? She's alive. Then why are we talking of she was a good woman? She still is a good woman. She still is a great cook. She still is. It's not past tense. It's present tense. I share that when I do celebrations of life I share that because I think it's very important very important if we really believe the word of God it says that our spirit not our flesh we don't like our flesh anyway that's why we go to the gym huh or, or we add to or we take away from but it's our spirit that's going to live for now where it lives forever it's up to you I share this too it'll either live in hell or heaven but it'll live forever Oh, oh, okay, okay, slow down, slow down, slow down, get back. We're not talking about death, get back. <laughs> slow down, Pastor Charlie. If she was that determined, we have to be that determined, we should be that determined also, because that's a kind of determination that reaches the king. Her determination reached King David. You have to understand that if you're full of determination, it's determination that reaches the attention of the king. When you have a spirit that is determined to conquer, that is determined to live for God, determined to do what God has called you to do, and even though you're facing things, and even though you're going through stuff, and you don't waver your determination is set you're developing a conquering attitude how is it with you it is well oh wait a minute your husband just died I know so how is it with you it is well 
It is well with my soul. But your kid, how is it with you? It is well. It is well. It is well. It is well. Soprano. That's a soprano. With my soul. That's old school. Yeah, well, you better get back to old school and learn what that means. It is well. How is it with you? Oh, man, you have no idea, dude. Got a minute? No, dude, I'm out of here. I don't want to hear it. Huh? I'm not saying these things aren't going to happen. Paul and Barnabas, they knew. They were told. The Spirit of God is sending me to Jerusalem. And the Spirit of God is telling me there's chains, there's tribulation, and you're still going? Yes. Why? Because none of these things move me. What do you mean? It is well with my soul. That's why you've got to know the voice of God. And you will not know the voice of God if you only pray once a week. And you never get in your word. Maybe if something bad happens, you'll go to John 3.16. Or you'll look up the scripture. Cleanliness is next to godliness. You won't find it. It's not in the Bible. Good content, but it's not in the Bible. No intimate relationship with God. You can't honestly say it is well. You don't even know. You have no Godfidence. You're striving for confidence, but you don't have no Godfidence. You don't know God. How can you have confidence in something or someone you don't know? You know of God. You know of Jesus, you know of the Holy Ghost, but you don't know God, you don't know Jesus, and you don't know the Holy Ghost. I am a friend of God, no you're not. I am a friend, no you're not. I am a friend, no you're not. I'm a friend of God. A friend will lay down his life for his brother. Have you laid down your life for God? Don't, don't, don't answer. Don't answer, just look at and down your row and see if you can find a joker that wants to say yes, but he, not true. Have you laid down your life for God? That's a friend. We don't, we don't, we don't go by that anymore. Nowadays, the friend that shakes your hands, a friend's going to stab you in the back. Okay, slow down, Charlie. Get back. You're wandering. Get back. Get back. Everybody say, Pastor, get back. Listen, you were in no wise created to quit and give up. You were not created to quit and give up. As a matter of fact, you were created to survive. Why? I told you before. Why were you created to survive? Because what you survive is what you will heal in others. Well, where's God going to use me, Pastor? What are you surviving right now? Well, I'm, 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 I'm seven years clean. Pastor, uh, Brother Ernie was sharing with me today. Pastor, I'm seven years clear to, clean today. I said, Pastor, Brother Ernie, seven years clean from drug addiction. Huh? So what are you doing, Brother Ernie? I'm surviving. Why? Because when I, as I survive this, um, that's where God's going to use me to heal others in. The drug addiction, how to survive and how to go strong. And what are you surviving? I mean, what are you conquering? I mean, really, what are you surviving? What are you not being conquered by? What is it? Do you have a conquering attitude? Are you being conquered by every little thing that comes your way? What is it? What is it? Babe Ruth, the famous baseball player said, it is impossible to defeat someone who refuses to quit. Impossible to defeat someone who refuses to quit. I love what Michael Jordan said, and I quote, I've missed more than 
9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to take the game-winning shot and I've missed. I have failed over and over and over again in my life and that is why I succeed. Oh, man, you, 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 you missed it. Write this down. Write this down. Here we go. Here we go. Write it down. Somebody say, write it down. Write this down. F failure will never overtake you if your determination to succeed is strong enough. Failure will never overtake you if your determination to succeed is strong enough. That's why you pray one more time. That's why you dream one more time. That's why you get up one more time. That's why you try one more time. That's why you ask. One more time, because failure will never overtake you if your determination, your confidence to succeed is strong enough. Can you say amen? amen. Can you give the Lord a praise? Hallelujah. My time's up. My, my time's up. Give the Lord a praise. I'll finish this next week. Now, I'll tell you why this message is of great significance. I, I, I believe every message is. But this message, developing a conquering attitude, is very significant for the double portion season that God is setting us into. Because I submit to you, and please hear me clearly as your pastor, that if you don't begin to develop a conquering attitude, you'll not remain in that season long. Now I know, I know, I know better than that, that not everybody will enter that season. That's completely up to you. But I know for a fact and from experience, not everybody will enter that season. And I'll tell you one of the reasons why. Because they figure, well, I'm in this season now and it's been hell. I don't wanna, I don't know if I can go to a double season and face double hell because it'll come. You go to Jerusalem, but I'm gonna tell you there's chains and tribulations waiting for you there. You go to that double season, but you think it's gonna be a tiptoe through the tulips? Are you that naive? I don't think so. If he's fought you here in this season, and God's going to double you up for his glory? You think he's going to quit? No. You know what he's going to do? You know what he's going to do? He's going to double up. But none of those things move me. I said, none of those things move me. I said, none of those things move me. Because God promised, and that's all that matters to me. Now I'm beginning to develop a concrete attitude. This is not about confidence. This is not about arrogance. This is about confidence. Because at the end of the day, we want to make sure he's glorified. And folks, that's all that matters. God would not be glorified with just confidence. But God is glorified with confidence. Why? Because confidence is based on the promises of God. Confidence sometimes is based on the accolades or the praises of men. Man, you're doing a good job, man. You, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. We need that in our lives once in a while. We need that. But if you're basing your success on those accolades and those praises of men, you may not make it. But when you've got Godfidence, because it's God that say to you, you're doing good, son. You're doing good, daughter. Oh, I know it's been tough, but look, you're still going. You're still going. I'm still fighting for you. I'm not going to leave you nor forsake you. And you start building that confidence. When God begins to speak to you and says, 
don't forget son don't forget daughter I can do exceedingly abundantly above all that you could ask or think yeah Lord you're right and, I, and don't, don't forget that I'll never leave you nor forsake you yeah Lord that's right and your God fittance begins begins to build don't, don't, don't forget that, that, that when you walk through the fire and you go through the water you won't be burned in the fire you won't, you won't drown in the water it will not overflow thee you know why because at the beginning of that verse he says because I am with you and the God fittance begins to build up. And so when you begin to succeed, they do brush to somebody and did When you begin to succeed, I believe I'm speaking the word of the Lord. And when you begin to succeed, you give no praises to man. You give all the glory to God. It's not confidence, it's God fittance. God bless you. Let's stand. Uh, this might turn into another series gosh darn it I want to make it a goal in 2019 to finish a sermon because <laughs> I never met a mic I didn't like oh church church please hear what the spirit of God is saying get unstuck nothing wrong with praying but don't over pray pray Sit five minutes to hear the direction of the Spirit of God and then go do what God's calling you to do. Let God build that confidence in you. You'll win this little battle, your confidence wins, and then you win this other battle, or God wins it through you. Listen, listen, the greatest example of that was David. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. But the greatest example of Godfidence was David. And you know the story. He comes up, up against Goliath. And of course, he's got a bigger situation that he's ever faced right in front of him. And what does he have? What does he do? He begins to speak Godfidence. I don't care how big this giant is. There was a day where God, through me, killed the lion. Yeah. And then there was a day where God, through me, yeah, killed the bear. Yeah, you're right. And then God finishes bills and then he speaks. And God through me will kill this uncircumcised Philistine. God fittings. Begin to look back at all the battles God has won for you. When you thought you didn't make it. When you thought you wouldn't make it. When you thought you wouldn't survive. Huh? When you said this is it or I'll never do it. Remember all that stuff way back when? And God moved. And the battle was won, and now you're here. And with this, I'll close. I do this. I do what I'm about to share with you. When I'm going through something, or I'm going through a battle, I go to my closet, and there's a big mirror. It's got to be big for me, get it? I thought that was funny. There's a big mirror. And I look at that mirror, and I stand there. And I'd say, all right, Lord, here we go. And I begin to put on spiritual medals of every battle that God has won for me. I remember when you won this battle. I remember when I was a gang member. I remember when I was an alcoholic. I remember when I was in and out of jail. I remember, Father, when, when, when I almost, when I died twice on that operation table and you saved me. I remember this. I remember when my daughters, I remember when my sons, I remember. And I start putting on spiritual, spiritual medals as a general in the work of God. And I start putting on these medals, medal after medal after medal of what God has done, of what God has done. And all of a sudden, my confidence begins to build up because I'm remembering of everything God has done and that battle that I'm facing none of these things move me you ought to try that I'm serious you ought to try that stand in front of a mirror begin to meditate on what God has done and put on that medal and what else God has done and then you put on that medal and that medal and that medal before you know it your confidence is so high you're now operating in a conquering attitude amen all right. Let's lift our hands. Father, I just thank you and I praise you. What a day. What a, what a time we've had in your presence. And we're grateful for this word. 
developing a conquering attitude. You're so awesome. You're so loving. And you're so forgiving. Thank you for the blessing and the favor in the lives of those in this room and those that are seeing us through social media. Thank you. Favor over their lives. Blessings in their household. We love you, Lord. And we give you all the glory. Thank you for that confidence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. We'll see you Sunday morning. Amen.